It's great to see you tonight, and we get to study God's Word. We are in the book of Acts, chapter 18. So I would encourage you to turn in your Bible to Acts, chapter 18. Uh, when Pastor Yuri was uh, praying and uh, mentioned the terrorist attack that was uh, thwarted in France, it brought to mind, I don't know if you've heard it, but um, you, you have the three Americans who uh, thwarted that, praise God for that. Uh, they were friends from childhood, and yesterday I just uh, happened to be uh, in the car, had a, a radio broadcast on, Terry had gone into the store and I'd stayed in the car, and uh, they interviewed those guys, and then the reporter uh, said uh, to one of them, I understand your dad is a pastor. And uh, he said, uh, yes. And then uh, they had the pastor on the phone, pastor of a Baptist church, and um, they began to talk to him. He gave a tremendous presentation of the sovereignty of God. Uh, I was I was thrilled. What an opportunity! And uh, so praise God for that. Pray for uh, further witness as a result of that. Well, let's uh, look to God in prayer. Father, how we do thank you that we can open up your Word and we pray for your your understanding that your Spirit, who inspired this Word, would be our teacher tonight. And we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we enter the 18th chapter of the book of Acts tonight. I have to begin with a question. Have you ever been really discouraged? Felt your cup was so full to the point that you can't handle it anymore? Um, I've had my ups and downs as a pastor. There have been several times that I wrote out a letter of resignation, but I praise God that I did not wind up turning it in. Uh, one time, I was so discouraged that I not only wanted to quit Irvine Community Church, but I wanted to quit being a pastor. And uh, I had insomnia, couldn't sleep at night, uh, perhaps a form of depression, and so on. But in the Bible, you read about people who are discouraged and who are depressed. You read about Moses, you read David, you read Elijah. And so on. But the person who surprises me the most at being discouraged is the Apostle Paul. Because I think most of us think of him as being a super mature believer, and I certainly believe that he was, and um, probably uh, one of the greatest uh, believers who ever lived. And yet, even the Apostle Paul went through a period of discouragement. And he went through a period of discouragement in a place called Corinth the city to whom the Christians were that he later wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians uh, in our Bible. Now we tend to put him on a pedestal and yet here he was so discouraged. We are in Acts, but hold on to Acts and turn over to 2nd Corinthians, the second of those letters that he wrote to these people. And in 2nd Corinthians chapter 7, Verses 5 and 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. For even when we came into Macedonia, that is the area north of Corinth where he had just come from, uh, where we are now in Acts 18. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. That's just a glimpse into an immense discouragement that the Apostle Paul went through uh, when he was in Corinth. But God gave him encouragement. Now, God is even called the God of encouragement in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 5, where he is called, quote, the God of encouragement. And God has many means of encouraging us, just like it did the Apostle Paul. And so as you'll notice on your outline, uh, in, in this section, we see the tremendous truth that it is God's will for discouraged Christians to be encouraged. And he has many means of encouragement. There'll be several of them 
that are mentioned in this particular passage. First of all, one of the means that he has is friends. Uh, God loves to bring encouragement to his people through their godly friends. And that's part of the reason that uh, we encourage fellowship. And on Sunday nights, we have the meal after, after the study that we call koinonia. That's the Greek word for fellowship. And it's a time where we not just eat together, but that as we are sitting together and talking, that we would encourage God, one another. God has, has done a lot of work around here at koinonia. As one person has been meeting and eating with another person and sharing and encouraging and helping. And so often as two people are talking, discover that one of them has a need and the other has the means of fulfilling that need and all kinds of things happen. But one of the things that happens over and over and over again is that God uses friends to encourage one another. And that is what happened with Paul here in Corinth. And first of all, he used new friends, and that's in verses 1 to 4. I think God delights to do that, that uh, here you are, and you're discouraged, and you're somewhere, and God brings across your path someone you'd never met before, but they're a believer, and they wind up being an encouragement to you, and you an, an encouragement to them. Look at this in Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens, and we studied uh, that whole situation in Athens the last two weeks. And last week we saw that philosophers need Christ too. And there were a lot of philosophers in Athens. They were just, uh, it was like a magnet for philosophers. And Paul had a great opportunity to share the gospel. There was not a lot of fruit, but there was some fruit. And so Paul left Athens and he came uh, to Corinth. Now Corinth would not be the easiest city to plant a church in. Um, it's, it, t today um, you could think of cities like uh, Las Vegas, uh, Hollywood, San Francisco, are not cities that I would tend to think would be the easiest place to go and plant a church. And that's why like Corinth was in Paul's day. Um, it was 50 miles from Athens, so it didn't take a whole long time to get there. Had a population of 200,000 people were in that area of the city of Corinth. It was a, a hub for transporting goods in the eastern Mediterranean Sea area. It, it, it was located in, in an interesting place. Uh, if, if you look at a map of Greece, you'll see that, that Greece has a very rugged, jagged coastline. And uh, there, there's a place south of Athens where you come to just a tiny strip of land, an isthmus. And then south of that isthmus, the land gets larger and so on. Well, Corinth was located at that isthmus. And the deal was that when ships were, were sailing from north to south, say uh, coming from the, one of the coasts, either the east or west coast of Greece, and they're going to be heading south, um, they're going to have to either go east or west when they get south. But it was considered very dangerous. And the ships in those days, they, they tended, for obvious reasons, to stay fairly close to the shore. But the, that shore in the southern part of Greece was one of the most dangerous, treacherous areas of the Mediterranean for ships to go. And so these ships are carrying goods. And so it was decided, in fact, uh, I've read that the sailors who would be going around the southern, uh, su southern edge of Greece were told, write your wills before you get very far. And uh, so what would happen is they would come south of Athens to this little isthmus. And it, because of the danger of going further south, it was actually considered better that they would pull in the port that they would either unload the ship and have all of the cargo carried across that, that small isthmus and get on another ship on the other side, or they would actually, they had rollers along that short distance, and they would put the ship on the rollers and roll it across that land. It, it was worth going to all that trouble rather than having to go in the treacherous sea. Well, what happens when you have a, a, a big commercial center like that? 
you've got a lot of sailors. You have a lot of, of, of business people. They're on business. And you have a city where people tend to be there for a short period of time. And one of the things that happens in a city like that where you have a lot of people with time on their hands is sin rears its ugly head. And Corinth just became a center of sin. And it was known as Sin City like Las Vegas is today. In fact, whenever in Greek plays they had someone uh, who was from the city of Corinth, they typically would portray him as drunk. It was a place of drinking. It also was a place of sexual immorality. There was a religion uh, located there. There was the, the, uh, the temple of the goddess Aphrodite. And as part of the worship of Aphrodite, there were a thousand pro uh, prostitutes who were priestesses. And they would go down into the city. The, the temple was up on the hill. They'd go down in the city and ply their trade. And Corinth was that kind of place. And that's where Paul has come, and he believes that God's mission and ministry for him is to bring people to Christ there and plant a church. So here he is at Corinth. But in the meantime, he is personally discouraged uh, because of the things that have happened prior to that, as we read about in 2 Corinthians. So what does God do? Brings him some new friends. Look at verse 2. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. And we're going to see this is a Jew who believes in Jesus. It's from Pontus. Pontus is a ways away from there. Pontus is a city on the south coast of the Black Sea in the northern part of what we call Turkey today. Could, it could be that he came to Christ as a result of the day of Pentecost because uh, in Acts chapter 2, when it lists all the Jewish people uh, who were in the city of, of Jerusalem and they heard in their own language and came to faith in Christ, it includes there were Jewish people there from Pontus. Maybe, maybe Aquila was one of them, or he heard the gospel from one of them. So there is Aquila, native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Now, uh, Priscilla is several times mentioned in the Gospels. She's mentioned a couple of times in the book of Acts with Aquila. She's mentioned in a couple of Paul's letters, but there she's called by the more formal name of her uh, for, the more formal form of her name, which is Prisca. And so here you have Aquila and Priscilla. They are a dynamic duel, apparently, because when you, when, when you read them about them in the book of Acts, they are serving the Lord, they are seeing fruit, and all kinds of good things are happening. And uh, so here they are. And, but how did Paul meet them? Well, he probably met them in the synagogue, because we, we are about to find that Aquila and Priscilla were by trade tent makers, and so was Paul. Although Paul was a full-time missionary, yet as a boy, he had been, his parents had been certain to make sure that he learns a trade, and that trade was tent making. And in the synagogue, you had the men on one side and the women sat on the other side, but the men sat according to their trades. And so that could very well be uh, how Paul and Aquila and Priscilla met. Because we know that wherever Paul went, he went to the synagogue first, if there was one. We saw a few weeks ago, he was in a place called Philippi where there was not one. But if there were one, he went there and he was giving the gospel to the Jew first and then uh, to the Gentile. But anyway, so he, he, he meets these people, Aquila and Priscilla, and they, they came from Italy because Claudius, who was the emperor, had commanded all Jews to leave Rome. And there's an interesting story behind that, of why Claudius ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Um, he decreed that because there was an upheaval. Get this, that there was an upheaval because of the teaching about a Jewish person named Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. -E Does the name Crestus remind you of anyone? Well, it's believed that that was a misspelling of the Latin way of saying Christus. 
Christus is the Latin way of saying Christ, which is the Greek translation of the Greek word for Messiah. And so most people who have studied it believe that really it was concerning the teaching of Christ in Rome. And this is long before Paul wrote the book of Romans, by the way. There were believers in Rome before Paul got there. And uh, so here is is this, this being upset about the teaching of a Jewish man named Crestus or Christ. And as a result of that, the emperor expelled all the Jews out of Rome, two of whom were Aquila and Priscilla. And then it says in verse 3, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. So they provided a house for him to stay in. And so they are Jewish, they are believers, and they are, uh, as it says here, uh, they were tent makers by by trade. Now you remember that the book of Acts was originally written in the Greek language, and the Greek word that's translated tent makers can also just as easily be translated leather workers. And tents were made out of, of, of leather. So it could be that they did more than made tents. They also made other things out of leather. Paul, uh, uh, growing up in a, in a good Jewish home, his good Jewish father would have been very sure that as he was a boy, he was taught a trade uh, so that he would always have something at least he could fall back on uh, if he had to. And so what Paul did when he came to places like this where there is not a church yet and there are not believers, uh, he would be involved in this leather making or leather working business and tent making business uh, to provide for his needs until there was a church that could provide for his needs. Verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So he did what his pattern was went to the synagogue, to the Jew first, and being a visiting uh, teacher, visiting rabbi, he would be asked to say something, and he would tell them about Jesus, and Jesus being the fulfillment of the Older Testament prophecies of the Messiah. And so he was seeking, as it says, to persuade, um, that is, to answer their questions and to show them that uh, Messiah is the Jesus who was fulfilled of fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament to the Jews who were there and also to the Greeks and the Gentiles because there were usually in the synagogue some Gentiles who were saying, you know, we're tired of this worship of pagan idols and and we really have come to believe that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the true God, but they had not gone through the ceremony of circumcision in the case of the men and so on and actually become a Jewish proselyte, but they were very interested. And so Paul is sharing the gospel with them. Then we come to verse 5. So God brought some new friends who were an encouragement to him. And then he brought uh, to, to Paul some old friends. And God delights to use old friends as well. For me, in that period of the deepest discouragement that I ever went through, that's what God used to encourage me happened to be the man who had been my favorite pastor of my pastors when I was growing up. Uh, He happened to uh, be a good friend of my uncle and aunt. In fact, it was my uncle who had led him to Christ when they were in high school. And uh, Don Fultz at that particular time was living in Oregon where he he lived um, for quite a few years until he went to be with the Lord last year. But he happened to be visiting down in Escondido where my uncle and aunt live. And my uncle and aunt had invited uh, him for dinner and invited Terry and me. And and Steve and Mark were little boys at that time. So we came from Irvine uh, to to my uncle's house. And I began to pour out to him of what was going on and my discouragement. And he had been there. And there had been a point where he had quit the ministry and so on. And he was uh, the one that God used. And in effect, he was saying, Dennis, don't do it. Don't quit. And so on. And God used him to encourage me. And I am forever grateful for that. And that's what Paul does here. He brings old friends back into his life. And so in verse 5, 
when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia. Now, Silas and Timothy had been with him on his missionary journey when he came from Turkey to the northern part of, of Greece. They were with him in, in Philippi and in Thessalonica and Berea. They had gone with him to Athens, but in Athens, Paul had sent them back so that they could continue helping encourage the new believers in these cities in the northern part of Greece. And so, but now, all of a sudden, they are back, uh, and there's a purpose that they had in coming uh, with them and so on that we may get into. Uh, and so they joined Paul uh, in, in Corinth, and that was used by God to encourage him. So when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. That is a tremendous expression. I, I don't remember it any other place in the New Testament that exactly put that way, that so-and-so was occupied with the word. First of all, I have to realize that's a pastor's job. And Paul is an apostle who is ministering as a pastor as he comes and brings people to Christ and he's helping them grow and establishing a church. That is a pastor's job to be occupied with the word. The word pastor means shepherd. And the big job of the shepherd is to feed the sheep. And what do you feed the sheep? You feed the sheep from the word of God. A person in our church this morning after the morning service was talking to me and she was she was very uh, excitedly sharing, uh, thanking me for, for something that I had said in the morning service that God just really used and, and so on. And then that caused her to further think of a gem of, of truth that I had not mentioned, but it was stimulated by what I had said and so on. And, and then she, she told me something she had never told me before. I remember that when she came to our church, she was uh, uh, new to the area. Uh, she had, was from Northern California, and uh, she was new to the area, and she was looking for a church. And she had gone to several churches before finding our church. But she told me the church that she was looking at and, and had been going to, um, one particular Sunday, the pastor said, well, uh, you're going to have to excuse me if the sermon really isn't uh, great and organized today because I didn't get to it until after the game last night. And she thought, after the game last night, what did you do all week, you know? And uh, so she said, I think I'll go find another church. The next Sunday, she comes to our church, and she said, what a contrast, because as I was teaching, she was following along, and she began to think, well, I think this guy, I don't think he waited till Saturday night, and uh, she, she then began to enjoy that, and, and she's absolutely true on that. I did not wait till fr Saturday night. Now, in the early days of my ministry, I did sometimes. I was a full-time student and so on, and I have to say that sometimes I came to Saturday night and I did not know what I was going to preach on Sunday morning. I am ashamed to say that. And after I had been here about a year, there was a, a Marine in our church who gave me uh, some, some tapes that a pastor had taught at a pastor's conference. And by the way, he is the uncle of, of Jan Halcom in our church, who's now with the Lord. And, um, but in this conference to pastors, he was telling pastors, your job is to teach the flock. And if you have to, chain yourself to your desk during the week so that you spend time in the word in other words, using the phrase here, you occupy yourself with the word uh, so that you can feed the flock on Sunday morning. And God used that to get me on that path that I have been ever since. So anyway, when I read this phrase that Paul was now occupied with the word, I say, yes, 
Praise God for that. But he, prior to this, he had to spend time with the leather working. What made the difference? He doesn't say it here, but we know it from other scripture that what happened, it's in 2 Corinthians eleven nine 9 and Philippians 4, verses 14 and 15, that Silas and Timothy brought with them money that was given by the believers in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and so on for the ministry of Paul so that he could devote himself to the word, so that he could teach, so that people could come to salvation, so that a church could be established in Corinth. That made all the difference, and that freed Paul up that he was able to, to occupy himself with the word as the pastor of, of this congregation. So that in itself is going to be used of the Lord to encourage him. And then it goes on testifying to the Jews and Greeks that Christ, in other words, Messiah, was Jesus. What a, what a ministry he begins to have in Corinth. And the fact that we have the two books in our New Testament, First and Second Corinthians, two of the longest books that he wrote, and all, it just shows us so much of what he poured into in the lives of these believers in Corinth. So praise God for the encouragement, both verbally as well as financially, that the coming of Silas and time, Timothy brought. Well, then we have in verses 6 to 8 another means that God has of, of encouraging uh, his, his discouraged servant, and that is God's work in people's hearts. Look at verse 6. And when they opposed and reviled him. So here he's, he's preaching his heart out, and he's sharing Jesus and so on, and yet there's an element there that winds up just reviling him. They revile Christ and they revile him, that he shook out his garments. Now, this is a very Jewish thing that he did. Nehemiah had done it in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 13, although the context was different. It symbolizes treating them as Gentiles because they were not fulfilling their part of the covenant that God had made with them as Jews. They were rejecting the truth of God. So it, it's the idea of treating them like a Gentile. And so he shook out his garments and he said to them, your blood be on your own heads. Now to have blood on your hands means that you bear the responsibility for the death of someone. But to have blood on your head means that you are to blame for your own judgment. And that's what he is telling them. You are to blame for your judgment. I, I have shared with you the truth. And you have rejected the truth. Therefore, the responsibility doesn't rest on me anymore. And, and that is taken from the Older Testament in Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel talks about the prophet being like a watchman. And the watchman, if, if there's an enemy coming and he fails to tell the people, their blood is on his hands because he failed to tell them. And Paul is using that analogy from the Older Testament as well. And so he says, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Verse 7, and he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. So that means this man is a Gentile, but he has left the pagan gods and has said, I, I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And look where his house was. His house was next door to the synagogue. Now, I, I, when it says that he, he went to his house, it doesn't mean that he left uh, Aquila and Priscilla and is living at Titius Justice house. But this is a house that is now going to be used for the fellowship of the believers and for the teaching of the word. And of all things, it just happens to be next door to the synagogue. I, I, I'm sure Paul said, you know, I couldn't have planned anything better. This was the very providence of God uh, that is doing this. And, and then verse 8, Crispus 
the ruler of the synagogue. This is a person who's in charge of keeping the synagogue running and plans the services and so on. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. And so there is some fruit that's coming. And here is Crispus in the synagogue that everyone knows, and he believes in Jesus. The Lord there is Jesus. So he believed in Jesus together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. God is working in people's hearts in the most discouraging city where he could be planning a church. Yet God is building his church. And you talk about something encouraging, that would be encouraging. When it talks about this group of people being baptized, we know the names of James and of Stephanus and Stephanus' household and a man named Erastus, who happened to be a city official of Corinth. And by the way, uh, we'll talk about it later, but they have found a stone in Corinth from the time of Paul with Erastus' name on it that, with the office that he held. And there was a man named Quartus, and we know a name of a man named Fortunatus. And they were all believers, and they were baptized. And uh, uh, this had to be very encouraging to Paul. But then we come Uh, to verse 9, 9 to 11, we have the third means that God used to encourage him, and that was God's word. Look at verse 9. And the Lord, that would be the Lord Jesus Christ, said to Paul one night in a vision. Paul did not have the completed New Testament as we do. And God, uh, prior to the completion of the New Testament, did speak through visions. And this was one of those times. And he tells Paul, do not be afraid. Um, Presumably, Paul was afraid for his safety because when you look at every city he has recently been to, uh, there has been persecution of Paul. There has been physical violence against Paul. Uh, you can imagine now everywhere he goes, he's wondering when is the persecution going to start and so on. He was beaten. He was put in stocks. He was put in prison, all kinds of things. And so the Lord tells him, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Don't let the thought that there might be persecution uh, cause you to stop speaking for me. And here's God's reason, for I am with you. Uh, He's not saying, I'm with you and I had not been before. He's always been with him. But he's reminding him, he's telling Paul something that has always been true, and that is the Lord is with him. That's something that we sometimes lose, lose sight of. That the Lord has always been with us and he's with us now and he will be with us. Psalm 46, I'm running out of time so I won't turn there, but Psalm 46 verses 1 and 2, I'd encourage you to write that down. Joshua chapter 1 verse 5 and 9, some great words from the Lord after Moses died and here's Joshua supposed to take the job of Moses. You talk about being intimidated and being scared and the words that the Lord speaks to Joshua saying, you know, don't be afraid, I am with you and those are God's words for us as well. But look what then he says. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Wow. God's sovereign. And God knows who in that city he has saved from eternity. And he knows in that city who his people are. They've been chosen by him since before the foundation of the world. And they are going to believe. They may be totally opposed right now, but the work of God in their heart is going to humble them And they are going to believe. It is a tremendous statement. And it is true throughout history that God has had his people. And so he says, I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months. He stayed a year and a half teaching 
the word of God among them. And between the lines, you then get the rest of the story in that those people that God was referring to here one by one, they believed. Paul preached and they believed. And they came to salvation. And so you talk about encouragement. That's the greatest encouragement. That your ministry is not in vain. And that God will bring fruit. I want to take time to read a letter. And uh, it it will take a a little bit to, to read it. This is from a missionary in Albania. Uh, as far as I know, none of you know him. He's not our missionary, uh, the Shocks. This is a different missionary in Albania. And, and listen, this happened just within the last few weeks. Jesus said, quote, Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me has eternal life, unquote. These words are some of the most powerful ever spoken on the face of the earth. Yesterday, I saw them written in Albanian on the back of a T-shirt by a man who was just to get baptized. I was overwhelmed by the power those words are still having on lives today. A few weeks ago, a friend told me about a village in Kosovo, which is several hours from our home here in Macedonia. My friend told a story about this village that was hard to believe. The story goes that there was a group of Muslim Albanians, so Keep that in mind, Muslim Albanians, who came down from the mountains asking for people to tell them about Jesus. Wow. Muslim Albanians in in a remote area coming into the city asking for someone to tell them about Jesus. They met a pastor who began helping them learn more about Christ. I've been waiting to hear more about the story, and just today I was able to hear the next life-changing part of the story. Earlier this week, I called a pastor friend of mine who lives in Kosovo. I asked him if he had heard about the story. He said, yes, those villages came to see me. See the providence of God working? I couldn't believe it. He was the pastor I had been told about. He went on to say that some of the people were getting baptized later in the week, and believe it or not, he said, I could go to the baptism. Today, Thursday, August 20th, was the day of the baptism. I made the drive up there this afternoon and came back in time to sit down and write it all down. My heart is full with the wonderful work of our glorious God. The psalmist was right when he said, my cup overflows. Hopefully, by writing this story and posting these pictures, your heart will be encouraged as well. My friend, my pastor friend, told me to meet him in Pristina, the capital city of Kosovo. After meeting him, he drove me out to a beautiful hotel nearby. He had told me about 15 people would be coming to be baptized, and they would use the hotel pool for the baptism. I was imagining a small circular pool, so I was surprised when I drove up and saw we had arrived at a hotel with an outdoor water park, complete with two big pools and slides. We walked down to the pools where a large group was gathering. You could feel the sense of anticipation in the air. I asked one of the people I met if, I could, if he could tell me the full version of what had happened. Listen to this. He told me the story actually starts seven years ago. My pastor friend had set up a book stand in town. Do any of our church people have involvement with a book stand? Yes, at UCI. This is the kind of thing that happens when the word of God goes out. So they, they had set up a book stand in town. A man from a certain village came and picked up a book. He met the pastor and then went away. As the years went by, this man became increasingly dissatisfied with certain religious traditions, which would be Muslim. He and others in the village felt pressured to act in a certain way. One day they felt they had had enough, and they went looking for the man who had the book stand. They found my pastor friend, and he started to disciple them. That was six weeks ago. 
The man telling me the story didn't tell me what had transpired during the last six weeks, but he told me they were looking forward to seeing the 15 people who were planning to come. Then I showed up. Uh, When I showed up, they had been setting up a table and getting things ready for the baptism. There were about 80 people there who were talking, waiting for the people to come. My pastor friend got a table ready with a tablecloth and a Bible. And then he draped a t-shirt over one side. The t-shirt had the new church's logo on it um, and uh, the name of the church and the location of the village. Later, that t-shirt would be joined by several others just like it. After waiting for 30 minutes, the group of people coming to be baptized arrived. Each person was wearing the same t-shirt as the one draped across the table. I counted 28 t-shirts in all, 28. It looked like the entire clan had come. Men and women were coming down the stairs to join us, and they were coming with their children too. The pastor called them all together and then gave them the traditional white hat of the region. They all put them on, and so did the pastors. There were now 30 hats being worn. The pastor welcomed everyone, prayed, and then asked for the worship team to come to the front. They sang several songs in Albanian, and then the leader of the group was asked to come read the scripture. He read the Gospels. He read with confidence and with a loud voice. He had all of our attention. After they were all baptized, we gathered and had a wonderful time meeting with new people and trying to come to grasp with the significance of what we just saw. I can't help but thinking about the power and majesty of the amazing God we serve. He is able to overcome any obstacle the hardest of which is often the human heart. My prayer is that you would be encouraged by this story. God is doing a great work in Kosovo. He told of one of the pastors, I would be praying for him, and I would encourage you to join me in that endeavor. And then he has some pictures uh, of the baptism. I mean, that's the power of God. Man has a bookstore, book table. Someone comes, takes, takes a Bible or one of the books, and... You don't see fruit for seven years. And then look at this. Amazing, the power of God. Praise God for the book table at UCI and those of you who faithfully go there. I'm, I pray that that kind of thing happens. And there may not be fruit today, tomorrow, someone takes one of those Bibles. It may be seven years. And it's on a shelf and they pick it up and they read and the Spirit of God works and uh, So praise God for the encouragement of Paul and Corinth, and it's still going on, of God and his work. Let's pray. Father, how we do thank you for your work, your work in Corinth, your work in Kosovo that we just read of. And Father, we know that you are the God of encouragement. And when we get discouraged and think there's not much fruit and what's the use and so on. Father, we thank you for those, those friends you bring who encourage us and your work in people's lives and you encourage us through your word. How we thank you for that. Father, we would pray for each one here that knows you. Father, that their hearts would be encouraged in the ministry that you've given each one. Father, we thank you for the food that's here and we pray your blessing on it in our time together. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.